Hi, everyone. Um, super excited to be back with you. I'm Matthew Stanny, and this time, um, instead of uh, the state's attorney joining me, um, uh, someone much more important to making open data more um, accessible, um, I'd like to introduce Lisa Lee. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Matthew. Um, my name is Lisa Lee. Um, I started to, you know, working for Matthew, joined the office in 2018 as a data intern. And then um, I became official in 2019 after my graduation uh, at UChicago. So um, my job, my daily role focuses a lot on, you know, communicating out open data. And so I answer a lot of data related questions coming inside or outside from the office. And uh, I'm very excited to be here as well. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you. So uh, today's presentation um, is actually a little bit of a continuation of what was originally presented um, back in February of 2018, I believe. Um, so it's been, I guess at this point, three years um, uh, since we've been down this endeavor. Um, but, you know, one thing I, I knew to some degree at the time that I was um, presenting um, to everyone, um, but have, you know, have a much deeper appreciation is for the complexity of the data that we have shared out with the world. Um, and so um, we have spent a lot of time, energy, effort um, in trying to think about how to better um, help people use um, the data. You know, we can publish something and technically we're transparent, but if no one can make sense of it, it's not really that transparent. And so, you know, we are trying to not just check a box and say that we have data out there, but um, are constantly looking at ways to improve and grow and, and create resources around, um, around this data. Um, so tonight, um, we are going to start with um, where we started originally, um, what we learned initially, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa to talk about the process of improving it, what, what we did and what we've learned post improvement. You know, I, I think that anyone that works in technology in data understands that, you know, iteration is the main, is, is the approach to development that we all are gonna continually do until um, we're not afforded the opportunity to do it anymore. Um, and so um, this is a bit of, of that cycle um, that we've utilized. So, where we started. Um, here are basically the kind of the four things that we had, um, to, that I had, and I guess the office had to start with. Um, you know, State Attorney Fox, um, when she was a candidate, I believe came and spoke um, uh, with you all at Shy Hack Night. And one of the things that um, she spoke to and that you asked her and pushed her on, in fact, was, um, you know, using data to create transparency in the state's attorney's office. You know, mind you, when she was running, um, it had been right after the Laquan McDonald video had been released. There's a lot of tension um, in Chicago um, and Cook County. Um, there, you know, has actually that, you know, for us to say that was the only time there was tension or, you know, um, uh, that, atten um, that tension um, was unique. Um, it was probably larger, um, but there's been a history of, of, of question, questionable behaviors um, within Cook County and Chicago. Um, and so really using data to help create transparency um, was um, both a great pillar for her to take as a candidate, but um, a great pillar for this community to push um, uh, with, with candidates in general. Um, so we had this pledge. We had a goal of making good on it um, um, uh, in February, by February 2018. Um, the county had uh, something called the Socrata Data Platform, which is an environment that allows us um, to uh, publish open data. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. They're kind of the elephant in the room um, in, the, in the world of open data. Um, and we had a system, a felony case management system that had over 700 tables and 7,000 columns. Um, so we had a lot to build with, um, but um, um, uh, we didn't necessarily have direction. 
Um, we didn't have um, any model to follow. Um, we couldn't say, oh, let's go look at what is happening in Brooklyn or LA around open prosecutor data and, and emulate what they do or look at what they do and, and um, innovate on it. Um, so we were kind of starting from scratch um, um, back then. But we were able to um, come back to um, Shy Hack Night on February 13th, 2008 and make the announcement that the data was gonna be ready um, and available in two weeks. Um, we took those 7,000 um, columns and those um, 700 tables and distilled them down to four um, tables um, that basically covered the major stages or phases of the case. Um, we were able to utilize Socrata's built-in tools around adding context um, to open data to help um, 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 articulate a little bit more about what's in the data. Um, and then um, beyond all of that, um, we realized that training would be necessary. And we came out with this idea called Hacking for Justice that we were able to materialize um, um, about six months later. And just to, to briefly touch base on this, this was a uh, two day um, program um, that we made available on a Saturday and Sunday. We actually teamed up with IC Stars um, and utilized their space and, and resources. And then we invited in a cohort of about 25. Um, individuals um, that wanted to come learn about the data that we were working with and, and um, essentially took them from, you know, being very beginner at R, um, um, with some of them had never heard of R prior to walking in the door. Some of them had used it a bunch. Um, and then um, uh, being very new to uh, prosecutorial data and then kind of work them um, in, in cohorts and groups and, and get them some training to, to get a better handle of R, this data, um, the, the, the system and process. So that was our our our, our starting um, point um, with with our open data, and, and we felt good about it, knowing that we didn't have um, anything um, um, to kind of um, model it off of, right? Um, but we learned a lot, right? And um, there are a few things that um, were really apparent um, um, in those early days. So um, when developing our open data, um, we learned that the better approach was to use an addition approach, not a subtraction approach. Um, and what I mean by that is instead of trying to take our 700, 700 tables and 7,000 columns and strike away um, to try to make um, sense of it and prevent um, you know, sensitive information from being shared and things of that nature, we started with nothing and started to build up. And so we kind of, we thought about it in the, in the, um, um, in the framework of what are the different parts of our system that we want to be able to have people explore, understand, analyze, um, and, and so forth. And so that's why we ended up with these four tables initially um, and, and started basically bringing in columns for it. Um, we learned that there are lots of questions. And what's been inter what was interesting about this, these questions were both internal questions. Um, our communications team didn't necessarily quite understand what was in the open data. And so they kept asking us, wait, can we direct reporters to answer this type of question? Can we direct reporters to answer this type of question? Um, and then we had a lot of external questions um, that were coming in um, on our open data. And you know, we definitely um, provided um, ways for people to get in contact with us and, and tried to field them but also knew that that wasn't necessarily the most efficient way of tackling that. So that led us to our next realization that we really needed some way to design out some efficient education um, around this, right? And there were kind of two things that we needed to really educate people on. One is on felony cases, right? A lot of folks probably watch Law and Order. They have some sense for how the criminal justice system works, but it's actually much more complicated than what you might actually glean from, you know, um, uh, watching TV programs or even, you know, God forbid, you are involved in a felony case, whether as a victim, witness, or um, defendant, um, that you would get you would get through that experience. And then the second piece of it was the idea of relational data is still something that even for populations that work with data and open data is something that we had to educate people on. You know, we have information on one table, information on another table. We have IDs that link across that and how people should think about those IDs, how they should make those links. We learned that people had many different learning styles. You know, some folks wanted us to get on the phone with them, uh, do webinar, screen sharing. Other folks could, you know, um, uh, you know, be sent an email with some instructions. Other folks really wanted hands-on, you know, um, training. And so we were trying to figure out how we can speak to all these different learning styles. Um, 
we learned um, that there are opportunities to improve the underlying data. You know, we published in February of 2018. I joined the office in November of 2017. You know, that was a three month uh, ramp up uh, period to, to learn a lot about what we had in our data, what we didn't have in the data, how it was structured, where there were pitfalls. And since then, we, re um, we realized there are better ways to show finding no probable causes, um, information about our diversion program, and, and even information around bond, um, which is a hot topic um, uh, in Chicago and Cook County. We learned that we can't make everyone happy, um, you know, um, and, and one of the things that always comes up is people are asking for criminal history um, and, and we understand why they're asking for criminal history. And unfortunately, because of the wanting to protect the individuals reflected in the data and the high fidelity of information, the high detailedness of information, we just don't feel comfortable putting criminal history, um, appending criminal history to individuals um, because we, there are some perverse effects that can happen. Um, and we learned that there were limitations in the open data tools um, that uh, we are working with and that we need to kind of think outside of the parameters of, of the boxes um, that we have. And to articulate that, um, I'll, 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 this is a, a screen capture from um, how um, Socrata organically allows you to express information um, um, around metadata in, in the data set. Um, so instead of having a formalized data dictionary or anything to that effect, um, what they um, have is a space for you to list you your columns and your column names, and then you can add in a description and, and show what type of um, data type is in there. And generally, this is helpful um, uh, to some degree or another, but um, it leaves you, leaves you very limited space um, to show um, potentially to show and explain the types of um, um, uh, fields, uh, types of um, uh, text and what those texts might mean within there. And, and so um, Lisa will go to explain this a little bit more, but um, seeing these limitations um, uh, were something that we definitely experienced. So I'll hand it over to Lisa now. Um, all right. Um, thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'll take it from here and talk about, you know, some of the improvements that we made and, you know, probably some lessons that we learned from making these um, improvements. So I will start by inviting everybody to look at the data set with me together. You know, this is um, one, of, one of the five data set that we made available online. This is the intake data set, and it talks about, you know, how a case was brought to the office and all that good stuff. So let's just look at the data set for a second. So there are columns in there that are very pretty much self-explanatory, like gender and locations and you know dates for different events. But there are also other columns like felony review result. This is one that's you know less intuitive and you you can use a little bit more guidance on you know what is a felony review as someone you know that you're not when you're not a lawyer, you may probably not know what is the felony review. And to look into the column, you can see the value it takes range from approved, continue investigation. So you need a little bit help on, you know, getting an idea of what those values mean. So that's when I started to form this idea of, you know, this is some great information that we published there and it deserves a data glossary that, you know, goes with it. So I want to create a resource center that people can, you know, come in and get the information they want and they know that they can rely on and trust the information. So that actually became my first solo project when I became official at the office. Um, and this is what the first page um, of the glossary looks like. It covers all five data sets re released and every single data fields we publish. You know, it outlines all the columns by data sets. And when you need a little bit more detail on one particular field, like the one that we just look at, the felony review result, you can just come to the data glossary. I'll show you in a bit how to find this glossary, but like you can come to the first page of the glossary, locate that felony review result column and click on it. Um, so the anchor or the hyperlink in the PDF is gonna take you to the explanation um, of that particular field. And we are here, you know, here we lay out the most common values that it could take under felony review result. So 
basically reading this, you will be able to understand approve means the SAO decide to file a charge and then rejection is no file. And then continue investigation is a little bit more complicated. It means, you know, there is a pending on the decision. So we're holding, um, waiting for law enforcement agency to bring us more evidence to file that charging decision. So like all those information, you can find them all here. Um, but as some of you may realize, um, we gave explanations or notes about only six most common values. So we make the decision of, instead of telling you every single value it could take under this field, we wanna talk about you know, the six most common one. The reason we make this choice is, you know, like these six values, they account for usually 95% of the case. And then they are generally you know, sufficient for most of the studies that look at approval um, rates. So those were the thought process, you know, lying underneath all the text that you can see right now. And to say that it's also like, to remind everybody is like the data team is still here. Like we are, we have five of us, we have five of us right now, and then we're here to help. We are easy to approach. We'll be happy to, you know, when you do have questions on other values that you take under this view, we're happy to look for answers with you together. So um, looking back at the process um, of creating this data glossary, right? Um, it was a process or it was a journey to realize how important it is to not only release information, but also release information that can be understood. So, so the entire process was like, when I came in, I'm not a lawyer, I know nothing about felony review or anything else in the system. And I'm not even from the country, so I'm like, oh, what's going on in the US criminal justice system? So I, what I did was like, I started by going into the detail of the data and then look for terms that confuse me. And then I would take those terms and I talk to a lawyer at our office and then try to understand their language. You know, like lawyers always have, always have this like lawyery way of describing things. So what I did was like, I try to internalize as much as they're talking, you know, their definition on certain items. And then I started to translate that into some more understandable or public facing language. And with that, like I said, English is not my first language and it's a very hard language to be honest. So I had to, you know, bring in my coworkers at the communication size, which is Julie, shout out to Julie, um, to help me polish the language in the data dictionary or data glossary. So um, like Julie was also invited to this tonight's event, but she couldn't make it because, you know, she has school going on, but she would have been the best person to tell the story of like how she has millions of questions about the things that I wrote and how she thinks that I write like a robot. And then she would constantly remind me, I actually appreciate that she would constantly remind me to write in a humanized way so that, you know, people, the public could understand um, what we later released to them. So as you can tell, the entire process of creating this data dictionary or glossary was uh, trying to achieve two goals or balancing two goals. The first one is accuracy. We want to make sure the information we release out there is accurate or correct, right? But then we also don't want to drown people in the information that we release. We want you know, so we try to use as least as jargons as possible. So that's like the accessibility part that we try to achieve there. You know, as Julie and I draft all the data dictionary together, and I struggle so much to explain the things, what we realize is that things are much easier to be understood when they come with visualizations. So I was like, okay, maybe we should just visualize the timeline in the data. We should just visualize the criminal justice system. And, and, you know, so I did it. So this is the very first prototype I created, right? I start with a very simple one-dimensional one dimension linear timeline. 
right? It has to start, right? Everything has a start, including a case. So a case has to start somewhere like um, there was an arrest by the police, or a case can be also started by direct indictment by grand jury. And then like on the right side of this arrow, it's like you can see there is always an end for the case. And there are so many ways that the case could end. It's like, we can reject it. The SAO can reject it at the very first, you know, felony review stage. Or the case could be dismissed after they were filed, or you know, or a case could go all the way through the criminal justice system and be prosecuted and sentenced. That could be an end. So with this prototype or this timeline in mind, I started to talk to you know, I started to talk to people like coworkers, lawyers, staffs at our office. They have like very rich knowledge about say a certain event on the timeline. So what I did was I tried to integrate all those information and bring them together into this beautiful case flowchart. And then, um, so yeah, so I added event, player, decision, you know, to the timeline. And um, this case flowchart here is showing you, you know, the full life of the felony case in Cook County. Um, I try to mark it, it's complicated, but I try to mark it um, with different color to, you know, um, reflect different stage of the case. And then also the different color corresponds to one of the five public data sets from intake, um, initiation, disposition, to sentencing and diversion. Um, you may be able to tell, but um, the little blocks the colorful blocks here are basically events that happen in the criminal justice timeline. And then the white arrow is how a case could flow. There are so many ways it could come back and forth. It can flow everywhere. And then the black arrow is showing you how a case can exit um, from the criminal justice system. But without getting too much into the detail, um, Eventually, to host all the stuff that we built, the flowchart, the data glossary, and we feel like we want to give a little bit more context about data. So we built this how to read the data open data page on um, the SEO website. So when I created this page, I envisioned a one-stop shop, like for everybody to get all the resources about data they need. And I also envisioned this one as one of those, you know, free online tutorial, you know, for people who want to do data um, using the SEO open data. So as you could tell, there are, these are actually hyperlinks. I can't click on it right now, it's on slides, but every um, five data sets have a section um, for them. And they walk you through basically what's the important subject in this, data sets and you know what you need to know to do analysis. I would say it has this side of like being very technical. So it talks about things like what are the IDs in the data sets? What are the units in the data set? So that's for like data users for sure. And then, but also I try to make this page as subject oriented as possible. So I try to talk about you know, those topics and try to give you some of the legal background um, on those topics. So you can, when you do analysis, you do have some more to chew on. So for example, um, under the initiation data set, um, we record bond that was assigned to the defendant. So if you click on initiation and you will be able to find a short description for bond, it's, I will not read through it, but it's telling you like, you know, what is the bond and you know, how bond works? Why are we giving people bond? And what, like, very importantly, what the SAO's role is um, in terms of um, giving, bond, uh, giving bond or in the bond courts. So I would say reading through the how to visit open data page will take you to a fairly good place of knowing what our office role is, you know, what our stand is, and, you know, knowing what kind of topic you can use or you can find in this data set to do analysis with. 
So going through all those improvements um, and data products we made, it was exciting. But I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, um, some of the implications that those data products end up um, with. And then also I want to talk a little bit about some reflections I did and some lessons that we learned from it. So as we know, the original design or its targeted user for these products are actually data users. They are scientists, analysts. And like I mentioned at first, part of my daily job was to answer a lot of data related questions coming you know, from the direct user of the data. So the intention at first was to create, you know, to anticip anticipate those questions and provide answers actually beforehand. So one thing I definitely noticed after we released the product was that um, people are now with these information in hand, they are now able to dive deeper into the questions. So I definitely noticed there are less questions that came to me about what is certain things going on in the justice system. And then, but more about, you know, how is this happening? Why is this happening? So I would say those questions come to me are actually deeper. And then I would also say um, the products we release out there empower and encourage users to raise questions, you know, with all the products we created and actively maintain, we try to build trust with the users and we try to make statement there like, you know, again, like, hey, we're here to help. If you want to talk to us, we're very easy to approach. So that's like the other application, applications, I would say, coming out from um, the data products. And then for data wise, I would say one more is, I think the products created a chance for collaborative data analysis. So encourages data scientists and researchers from different organizations to use the data and actually, you know, lend us their intelligence and do a lot of analysis for us and with us. Um, but beyond the world of data, like the implications there were actually those that surprised me. Um, and I realized these products actually go beyond, you know, the scope of data and they have a broader audience than I first anticipated. I learned that internally within our office that supervisors sent out the flow charts to their new employees for them to, you know, understand the flow within our office. And I know that, you know, everything, the package was sent to reporters who want to write or use the data and write stories um, about criminal justice system. And then, you know, community outreach is always a focus of our office. And I know that um, the data team has been receiving invitations to do presentations about these products with community members. Because we believe we can help shape a more informed, um, and trusting dialogue between the office and the community members. So we can, we're, we're now at a better, better place to explain what our office did. And not only to that, we can also invite community members to join us if they also wanna take a look and you know get dirty with the data. Um, I wanna show two quick exp uh, examples of the applications. Um, people love the flowchart, right? So this is the flyer that my coworker uh, at comms created for the public about carjacking. So it chose to tweak and build upon the felony flowchart and show how a carjacking case is like moving over, uh, moving for through the system. And here is a project that John Jay College did using our open data. Right, so they've, you know, basically took the data glossary and took everything available online and they were able to create this amazing tree map pretty much independently, like without too much of our help using the open data. So all these, you know, applications allow me to believe that what we've done improve or get us closer a little bit to the goal of transparency. But also, I, at the end, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the lessons I learned from the project. 
I guess the biggest thing I learned is um, doing open data well is hard. And to do it well, you need to provide people with complementary resources. And to build that resource hub, it takes time and it needs people to be thoughtful about the information they provide. And things won't be like instantaneous. So achieve that goal, I guess like the thing I learned is first thing first, you have to identify what are the helpful or available resources around you. So for me, I realized first, I need my own brain as a data analyst to figure out you know, what data users need to do analysis. And then the second is, I know that I need resources for um, subject matter aspects, including lawyers who can tell me the accurate definitions on terms or policy advisors who can tell me the stand of the office or policy of the office. And then third is I know that I need help from communication side, someone like Julie to make everything you know, digestible. And the second thing I learned is beyond that is it's, we need to acknowledge that what we're doing is difficult with all the resources that we need to bring together. I know we talk about the mission of transparency, but things are always gonna be trickier at the operational side. So it was, I remember it was at least half a year, more than half a year to get everybody to look at the thing I created and to sign off on it. But I get it, right? So every individual in the organization has a lot going on on their plate. And it's a lot to ask for people's time. And for an organization, they always have like, all, many agendas. And for a prosecutor's office, the leadership was focused a lot in addition to you know, getting data product out. So I would say my takeaway is it's helpful to set your expectation right and acknowledge the difficulty of that. And the second thing that I found useful or helpful at the time was that Matthew actually spent a lot of time pitching the project to the leadership, explaining the importance of it, you know, the applications of it, and you know why it will get, you know, get, get us closer to the goal of transparency and all that good stuff. So this kind of support or understanding from the top is making sure that we eventually get the resources we need for our project and maybe expedite it a little. So um, big shout out to Matthew, not because he's my boss, but because he was very supportive uh, during the process. Um, so this is it. We are still learning and refreshing our mindset for data transparency. And I look forward to hearing your questions, comments, or advice on it. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're looking forward to uh, asking some questions and um, appreciate the wonderful presentation. Um, give us a second here as um, we check out our YouTube channel, we've had some questions already submitted, um, but let me check in with Michael. Um, did you did you want to ask the first question or should I? Uh, sure, I can ask it here. Um, so the first question we had was, uh, does the state's attorney office accept FOIA requests for data uh, from your database that's not available uh, through the open data portal? Um, and if so, in what formats can your database be exported for those requests? So we don't export um, um, our database <clears throat> due to a FOIA request. Um, um, the information in our database includes information about victims, includes information about um, witnesses, um, ultimately, it includes a lot of very sensitive information that does not, um, my understanding is, is not considered responsive to a, a FOIA request. Um, if folks have like other questions that are data related, you know, we have to assess like each one of them. If the question's already answerable with the open data, we direct them to the open data. If the 
question requires us to actually um, do something, um, then I listen to the guidance of our FOIA lawyers and our general counsel. Okay. I think the, the question too is just like, if, if it is deemed that, um, that you can provide that data, like what, what sort of formats can, can it be provided in that they could, whoever requested it could use it? Yeah, I mean, I guess like, it, I mean, and this isn't my like trying to be um, challenging, but the word data means information, right? So, you know, we have given information to people in CSV files, in um, PDF files, in all sorts of digital formats under the sun. Um, you know, depending on what the information is, there may be a more or less appropriate format for that information, but like in the abstract, like if you know of a way to store digital information, you know, it is on the table of potential possibilities, but there are a lot of other considerations that would go into it beyond, um, you know, just saying, oh, we're going to put this information in this format. Um, sometimes taking information from one format and putting it into another format isn't very easy. Great. Thank you. Um, Cameron, do you want to take the next one or? Yeah, I'll ask the next question here. So, um, so the questions are starting to come in through um, chat and just sharing, you know, um, one comment uh, here was uh, not a question. So before I ask this next question, it was, I uh, just wanted to point out how awesome it is for somebody to break down felony cases in Illinois who's not even from the US. So that was a comment there. Um, but uh, the next question is about um, the Chicago Justice Project lawsuit. The question is, uh, was there a discussion um, how to answer um, questions about this lawsuit prior to this uh, event? I, I, I'm not... I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly what the question, if this event is this like conversation, like this presentation that we're giving right now, um, as Lisa and I put together the presentation, we did not even like discuss the Chicago Justice Project in, in the process of putting together this presentation. So, um, you know, um, if, if that answers that question, I don't, you know, if the event is publishing what we published, um, I don't know, Lisa, like when on day one, I feel like I said, hey, I want to augment and improve our open data resources. And, you know, as you said, you spent six months trying to prepare them and publish it and get the appropriate sign offs and all of that good stuff. And again, it wasn't in response to a lawsuit. I don't believe there was a lawsuit at that point. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I don't know which event we're talking about, but unfortunately, it doesn't sound like either events are responsive to a lawsuit. Thank you. And just a reminder for um, our audience, feel free to share your questions through the Q&A. Just a reminder um, uh, to take a look at the code of conduct uh, as far as uh, tone goes. So just a friendly reminder here. I know there's some, uh, some sensitive questions in the chat. So I think we're all well versed on uh, how to approach that here at Shy Hack Night. So uh, I'll throw it over to um, Michael for the next question. Thanks. All right, thanks. Um, this next question is, can you say more about the addition approach versus the subtraction approach to open data? Uh, does that mean constructing new data sets versus transforming existing ones? And what did that work look like? Yeah, I, I would say that this is like the difference between 3D printing and sculpting. Um, if you will, sculpting uses subtraction, subtraction approach, right? Um, so from that standpoint, you have a block of marble and you know you start chiseling it away, right? And I'm not a sculptor by any means, but my understanding is early on, it's easy to remove big chunks. And then you have to get in there with a fine, um, a fine instrument to like, you know, show lines in a face or details in a hand or whatever the case may be. Um, the addition approach is kind of looking at all the data as raw material and then figuring out which piece of raw material you want to put you know, together um, and make available. Um, so you're bringing things over from it and making sure that um, um, you know, um, you're representing it correctly. Um, um, you're you know, bringing over things that are important and valuable. Um, both approaches require some level of um, transformation, 
um, you know, and one of the things, and we've done a lot of work, um, you know, uh, talking about thinking about data exchanges with some of our partners and things of that nature. Um, and at the point that you touch data, even if you choose not to transform it, you have the opportunity to transform it. And I think that's like that, that default of just not choosing to transform it actually like is some level of transformation because you're choosing, there's an active choice that you're doing. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to get data that's untransformed. In fact, even if we think about where the data comes from originally, and Lisa and I talk about this all the time, we call it, call it the data supply chain, um, if you will. Um, um, you know, people are entering in this data, um, whether you're getting data, looking at data from the clerk of the court or from CPD or from our office. And at some point they're looking at some piece of information, piece of paper or something and choosing what goes into it. And they're actually applying some level of transformation to it as well. Um, and so, you know, always thinking about, um, you know, how, how the data moves through um, is important for understanding the best, um, best way to think about it, utilize it, understand it, all that good stuff. All right, thank you. Um, so taking a look here at the next uh, question. Um, our next question is, um, great work. Has this data affected internal data-driven decision-making? Yeah, I would say yes. You know, um, I think one of the things that Sister Fox ran on um, is um, encouraging the criminal justice system to move away from anecdote um, to actual data, right? And, you know, we know that the work that we're doing um, can be more scrutinized than it ever has been before um, by the general public. Um, you know, our data has been used to write stories that have actively criticized the direction the office um, is going. We've been criticized by individuals on the left. We've been criticized by individuals on the right. Um, you know, we've been uh, criticized by reform-minded individuals and what we'll call law and order-minded individuals. Um, I think that, you know, we are, um, as a, as an office trying to make decisions, you know, are, are trying to make the decisions that best reflect the values um, that the office um, holds, right? And so um, I think, you know, we're more generally self-aware um, that, um, you know, we um, can be questioned, asked um, a, about what we're doing and people, you know, there's a tape that people can point to and say, oh, did you change your policy on retail theft? Well, let's see how many people got, um, you know, prosecuted with retail theft in 2017 or 2018. You know, um, are you doing anything about gun violence? Well, let's see how many people got prosecuted by um, your office um, regarding gun violence. Um, and, you know, um, but we are not trying to, you know, we're not looking at the data and then making a discrete decision on a specific case, right? We're not saying, oh, you know, we're, we're having too many convictions in this category. You have to get a non-conviction or, oh, you know, um, we're getting too many non-convictions on this, um, on this category. So we're not going to, you know, um, uh, you know, we're not going to accept a plea or, or a diversion program for someone. Um, um, so um, it, it definitely, you know, we're more, um, data centric than we have been as a result of, of, of people being able to use the data um, and, and analyze the work as, as we do it. Yeah, and to just like add a little bit to that and is like we have projects or data project, projects that we started with institutions like Loyola and we have mm -hmm. researchers coming in and try to, you know, take the open data and then to, you know, uh, like come up with the so-called prosecutorial performance indicators. So that's what their effort was trying to do, you know, like use like having an eye coming outside of the office, trying to measure um, what's going on in the office. And I found that, yeah. And I guess I touch a little bit in the presentation. It's about like how we make resources and we make this open data better and more accessible for more minds to put um, be put into this field, if that makes sense. Yeah, and Lisa actually brings up an, an excellent point. So I'll give one like real crystal example, right? And I, I'm not gonna pretend that like we're good at this yet, but there are really two points where our office has the ability to decide um, uh, to discontinue prosecution on a case. 
The first is at the felony review stage, right? So this is for every case, and just to give some background for folks that um, aren't familiar, every case um, that is a felony arrest that is not narcotics related, um, the, um, our office actually makes a decision on whether or not that person gets charged with a felony and then what charges get applied to that. Um, so it's our office that makes the decision. At that point, we could identify the cases being one that we don't want to pursue um, and don't want to pursue because the facts of the case um, don't um, warrant it or you know, there might be a policy um, decision around it that, um, uh, um, uh, that, don't want to, that makes us not want to pursue it. After we charge the case, throughout the rest of the duration of that case's life, we have the ability to what we call nolly um, process. Um, or nolly prosecution, um, the case. Um, it's a fancy way of saying we decide to no longer pursue the case. Um, we nolly pros a lot of cases, right? In an, you know, in, an, in, in a highly efficient um, prosecutor's office, ideally, they're catching all the cases at the felony review um, aspect of it, and therefore they don't have to nolly any cases down the road. Now, in reality, they're, you know, witnesses, you know, for change their mind, their testimony falls down, they, um, you know, unfortunately pass away, natural causes, unnatural causes. Um, so there are reasons that cases could fall apart over time. And so you'll never get to 100% catching it on the felony review side. But that is like one example um, of um, people using the open data, thinking about the process of our office, and then um, recommending um, some level of um, overall justice system efficiency that could um, be aspirational to kind of optimize around. Great, thank you. Um, Cameron, do we have time for one more question or? Yeah, Matt, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Um, Michael, you can go ahead and ask the next question, sorry. Okay, um, yeah, so last question then. Um, will you add a column of intake data that stems from an arrest originating from a quote unquote problem officer of a particular department um, or include officer info at all? Yeah, that, that's a great question on, on the officer information. Um, the couple challenges um, we have right now with it that, um, you know, and I understandably, um, un it's very understandable why people are interested in officer um, information. The big challenge we have right now is that the information about officers being involved in cases that um, we collect and maintain is very incomplete and very spotty. Um, and, um, um, you know, we have tried hard internally to better organize um, police officers, but there are a few things that are a bit tricky. The primary way a police officers recognize, at least it, um, in CPD, is by their star number. And star numbers, I believe, are five-digit numbers. Um, and um, they, um, they change um, over time. Um, if you're a detective, you have a certain level of star number. If you have a different, um, if you're a, um, you know, lower on the totem pole, a patrol officer, you have a different um, star number. Coupled with the fact that um, you can have two different people with the exact same name ending up with the same star number. Um, uh, you know, CPD is very generational. Um, um, and so you end up with people, you know, junior, third, so on and so forth, working in um, the police department. And like, ideally, when that happens, those that are following their their parents' footsteps are trying to ultimately end up with their parents' star number when they retire and such and things of that nature. Um, one of the things we really want to do is, you know, reflect things accurately because we know people are going to take this information and draw conclusions with it. And we totally understand the desire um, for them to do so. Um, but we really want to have strong confidence in it. And actually, there is um, both a, a, a young man who worked at our office um, at one point as an extern um, joining this um, named Todd. I can see him in the chat. And you know, um, everyone should thank Todd because um, the bond data that um, we have in our system um, and the quality of it wasn't realized um, until um, Todd came into our office and started poking around and was like, actually, I'm seeing good coverage, about 70, 75% coverage on this. You know, um, we were able to kind of sit down and look and, and, and better understand it and feel comfortable that it actually reflects something true in, in reality. And so then we ended up adding it to, to our data. And this is again, like the evolutionary process. Um, you know, we've been working hard 
at um, bringing in a new case management system, um, um, just as knowing that um, there are limitations in the current system that we have and, and there are better ways to do this type of work. You know, as we do that, you know, we want to enhance the data that we're getting um, through and through to, to be able to tell a better picture. Um, so, you know, we're aware of the shortcomings and we're constantly working against them to, to provide a better picture. 